Any questions at all about the quiz? And you're all pretty good about it. I mean, I saw the scores and you all did pretty good. So great. I appreciate that. That means that you're going back and you're looking at things and, you know, seeing the PowerPoint, then the cahoots and knowing that they do work for you. So what we're going to do now is let's go ahead and let's go ahead and start the uh, PowerPoint. All right. Remember, if you're not understanding something, stop me. I'm sure somebody else is going to have the same question, but we're afraid to ask. I don't bite. That's the one thing I don't do. I don't bite. I'm pretty, pretty calm person. So let's start out with our school age children. You know, when we talk about school age children, this is chapter 34, and then your adolescence is chapter 35. So school age, what is school age? Well, school age is ages six through 12. So if you think about those ages, what do you think about? You think about a kid in kindergarten, right? First grade at the most. And then a kid who at 12 is now going into eighth grade. So you've got a wide variety of children and a lot of things to think about. Like how do you get on a developmental level of a six-year-old versus a 12-year-old, right? So there's a lot of differences. So when we talk about age six, this is when their teeth, the baby teeth start falling out. It's like the age of all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth, right? I mean, my little Christian is now a little over six and I'm still waiting for his teeth to fall out, but he's done everything slow. So maybe by age seven, his teeth will fall out too. By the end of school age, they're going to have all their permanent teeth in. So all of those baby teeth come out, the deciduous teeth, and then it ends up with all of their teeth in there. And then it's the beginning of puberty. So we're talking about slow, getting taller, you know, plateauing, gaining weight, but on a slower stage than we did in the first year of life. It starts with, you know, physical and emotional maturity where they're starting to look older um, and emotionally they're starting to become mature. But the one thing you need to remember is just because they look older doesn't mean their minds are there. So find out first, get on their level, see what they understand first. Because you have a lot of kids who look older at especially that 11 and 12 year old age. As I said, your height and weight grow slowly, but you're talking six years of growth. So you can gain one to two feet in those six years. And your weight is going to almost double by the time you're six and the time you're 12. And boys and girls at this point are the same. So when they become adolescents, the boys get taller and bigger. They become more graceful. They're not as, as clumsy. Their muscles, you know, are starting to uh, get more toned. Um, that baby fat starting to go away. That head circumference, chest circumference, there's just no correlation between them anymore. Their faces start with a baby face and then they're going to grow up and have more of a grown up face as they get older. And as I said, those teeth come into play at age six. <clears throat> you know, at six years old, you're always stopping for having a bathroom break when you're along trips in the car with children. By the age of 12, they can hold it a lot longer because their bladder capacity does increase. Their heart, which used to take a lot of their chest up, by the age 12, it becomes smaller in relationship to their whole body. They have had so many colds and coughs and flus and all of these, you know, illnesses that their body's built up a great immune system now, and it can really um, take care of itself. Their bones are starting to ossify, which means more brittle. They can break easier, right? Physical maturity, as I said, is not correlated with emotional or social maturity, as I don't think because they look like they're old enough that they should behave that way. Not all kids do. Depends on many things. I mean, even depends on the family and how does the family smother them and not allow them to grow or that, that family, that parents who, you know, encourage them to grow and to be more mature. So be aware of that. Now, children 
sometimes will start having these um, behavioral changes. Maybe that they were nice, compliant kids who always wanted to do good and all of a sudden they're getting angry and they're getting mean to other kids. That means, and this is a sudden change sometimes, this could be signs of stress and stress could be anything. It could be that, you know, dad lost his job. Um, they had to move to another place. They, they lost their best friend. The dog died. You know, grandma and grandpa had to move away. Whatever it is, that is stress. And that's true and real. And you will see behavioral changes in them. You know, pre-adolescence, when we talk about um, we call it the two years before puberty. Now, puberty starts with changes and it happens about 10 in girls and 12 in boys. So boys are about two years behind girls. You know, when you think of age 10, you're thinking about a, a child in the fifth grade. What, at that age, you remember that boys are still stupid, right? They're acting immature, you know, and you didn't want them to, boys are stupid then. Um, but, you know, because the boys haven't caught up with that maturity level, they haven't even started going through that puberty thing. Now, assessment, how do you assess a school age child? Well, we've talked about infants, preschoolers, toddlers. Now, school age children want information, but remember the age of the child. You might say, you know, you need to get a chest x-ray. I'm going to send you over to the radiology department. You say that to a six-year-old and they're going to be scared. What is that x-ray? I'm just going to take a picture of your insides. And I'm telling you many times, you know, working in the emergency room, we, we were great. We had computer screens in every room. I could pull up x-rays and I could show them pneumonias or I could show them a broken bone in the arm or the leg or the finger and they can see it. And actually when children see things, they understand it better on how to take care of it, okay? So it's gonna be a big camera, I wanna take a picture. I wanna see the inside of your body and then you show it to them if you can. You inspect your auscultate, your percuss, your palpate, your lymph nodes, you shouldn't feel unless they're ill, okay? Anywhere. And then doing the assessment you wanna do of the hypoglossal nerve, just have them stick their tongue out. Even infants will stick their tongue out for you. You know, they like to imitate, right? And then there's ways to assess breath sounds. Now, children tend to have shorter necks and you have a lot of upper airway noise. And sometimes it sounds like it's in the lungs, but it's not. So if you do wanna hear that bronchial breath sounds, you're gonna place that stethoscope over the tracheal, right where this little notches between the two clavicles, right in there. And when you listen to that, you're listening to upper airway. I actually teach new nurses, listen to their throat on either side because you're hearing all upper airway mucus. And then when you listen to the lungs, they're clear. So you might say it's ronchi, but it's not. It's all upper airway. And children can confuse you that way until you're used to it. Now, Freud. Freud, again, is all about same-sex peers, okay? They're not into um, girls having boys as friends or boys having girls as friends. And they're starting to be able you know, to have a relationship with a same-sex peer. This is what Freud says. Now, Erickson. So Erickson's more about things and doing things and be able to do things um, and having your needs met, right? Well, Erickson talks about a sense of industry. Well, what does industry mean, right? <laughs> it's a big word and, huh. Well, industry are things you do well. Now, I was good at spelling. I was good at math. And I actually did tap very well. And I was eight, uh, eight years old. And I'd be in that, you know, in the end where they have that big thing with all the best, you know, tap dancers. And I'd be tap dancing. That was what I did well. That's my sense of industry, the way that I could do those things. But what is those things that you don't do well? And that is the sense of inferiority. Because no person can do everything well, right? So industry, I do it well. I feel good about it. 
Now, the one thing we need to remember is when we're doing something or asking a school-age child to do something, make sure that they're able to accomplish the task. Don't make that task more than what they can do because then they get that frustration, right? So industry, I do it well, makes me feel good. I could do it by myself. And my peers think it's pretty cool that I can do whatever that is, right? And then that inferiority. So I want to um, be able to kick that ball as far as everybody else, or I want to be able to write my writing, you know, as good as everybody else. You can't do everything well, right? So you feel a feeling of inferiority because you can't do everything well, because nobody does, right? So industry, I do it great. Inferiority, I wish I could, but I can't. Now, Piaget. Now, Piaget talks about relationships of things and ideas. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, it's what we call this master of concept of conservation. Now, what does that mean? This is like, okay, conservation. Well, think about it's understanding things and changes in things. So you get a glass of water in a short fat cup and you put it in a tall skinny cup and you take that fat cup, you pour it in this tall skinny cup. Now the tall skinny cup looks like it's a lot more stuff, right? It's the same amount of water. School age people can understand that. Younger kids don't. They'll always say that tall skinny glass has more stuff in it. They don't get that yet. Take a piece of clay and it's a ball of clay and it looks big and round. You smush it and it's still the same amount of clay. All that ball looked like it was a lot more. Understand you change the way things appear or look, but it's the same thing all the time. Whether it's the way that you put pennies or blocks or this or that, it doesn't matter. It's still the same. Now, <coughs> this is what basically what I just said right there. Another thing they're into as in cognitive development as we're talking about Piaget is sociocentricity. It's they're starting to understand like mommy don't feel well. She's laying on her couch. Let me go get her her favorite pillow or blankie and give it to her. Maybe it make her feel better. Or maybe if I give her one of my special things that make me feel better, whether it's a doll or a teddy bear or whatever it is, because school age children still have those little items that make them feel better at the younger stage, right? Now. Formal operations, we have concrete operations and we have formal uh, operations. Most of school age are your concrete operations. And it's basically, they can just start to figure things out. You know, if I'm good, I'm gonna be able to get the things I need. When it gets up to formal uh, constant operations, this is more of your adolescence they can manipulate the situation to get what they need. So formal is, all right, if I do good in school, I get an A on my test, mommy's gonna bring me to the movie or let me go with my friend or go over to my friend's house, right? Formal operations is, mom said I couldn't do whatever, whatever, but I know if I do this, I do this, I do this, she's gonna let me because I've been so good. That's the manipulation. It's a lot more sophisticated than just concrete. Now, Kohlberg, now we talked about Kohlberg as the younger kids, good and bad and a consequence for each. Well, as we get to school age is they wanna do good. They wanna please. They wanna do good things and please. And that's all about, you know, what Kohlberg is. Again, doing good, I want to please. They're not gonna do bad things, because they want to please, they don't want the punishment for it either. Spiritual development, again, very concrete. They need to see it. They need to understand it, whether it's to go to church, whether reading a book, whether mom and dad talking to them, whatever that is in spiritual development, we all raise our families in different ways. 
So it's to understand that there is spirituality, whether it's the Christmas tree, whether it's the Easter bunny, whether it's, you know, the birth of Christ and it's, you know, um, Jesus on the cross and Easter Sunday. I mean, all of these things is depends on what the family again teaches them. Um, and there's all different religions, right? So, you know, whatever has been taught to them. Now, children do want to know about God. Christian asked me that Jesus walked on water and he wants to be good so he can walk on water. And I was like, where did you learn that from? You know where you learned that from? A YouTube video. He's a YouTuber. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So then I had to describe Jesus and walking on water and what those things meant. Um, again, he's six years old, beginning of school age, and he has a big desire to understand God and understand what that all means. They are actually to this point where if they do bad things, they expect to be punished. Let me give you a little explanation about that and how that can play a part if you wanna work in pediatrics. Now, one of the big things that I've seen in the emergency room the last 10 years of my career was kids coming in school age with a, acute appendicitis and need surgery. I know before I sent those kids to surgery, I'd sit down next to them, of course, build my rapport, do all those things. <laughs> and I'd say, you know something, you didn't do anything wrong for your appendix to say, I don't wanna be there no more and cause you this pain. I said, sometimes it just says, hey, I wanna come out and they take it out. So don't worry that you've done anything wrong because they think it's because they hit the sister yesterday or they didn't take the garbage out or whatever it is, they have a feeling that they're being punished for the behavior. And then another thing I tell them, I'll make sure the doctor puts an extra stitch so your insides don't come out. Because the younger school age children think you're gonna bleed to death. Like remember preschool is the age of band-aids, right? So we know that still they've got some of those thoughts in them. And I'm telling you, you can watch shoulders all tense and scared. All of a sudden they relax, they go to surgery and they're actually gonna have better outcomes because I just said those couple little things. And then the kid gives me a hug and I give him a sticker and everything's good, right? <clears throat> School age, peers are very important. Remember up to this age, preschool, you know, toddlers, all about, they go to school, but they go home and mom and dad, aunt, uncle, nana, pop, pop, whoever you call them, is their biggest influences. But now they start getting those same sex peers and they have different cultures. They look different. They know different stuff. They're not like me. So they're starting to open their mind to other people and to other relationships. This is building that independence away from mom and dad. So same-sex peers, very, very important. <clears throat> getting into clubs, getting into peer groups is important. Just remember in any group, there's gonna be bullies. You know, Girl Scouts is a great thing. I did brownies, I did Girl Scouts. And there was always that one who had one extra badge than me. And you're like, and they always shove it in your face. Well, I got this one and you didn't get it yet. Remember, it's going to happen. So parents are very important to make sure that the child can talk to them about this one kid who keeps, eh, 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 I got more than you do, right? But in any, any age, we're going to see that in some way or another. Again, parents are still there shaping their behaviors. Their, be, uh, their values and their personalities, they're still there. But remember, they're starting to gain independence because what happens after their adolescence? They go away to school or they move out of the house. They get married, right? So this is the start of that breaking point, understanding others, being able to get along with them so they have that independence as they move forward and they'll be able to be successful as, as that. And at this point, Parents need to be adults, not their friends. They need still to set up certain rules, restrictions, but to be there as somebody they can speak to as much as possible. And again, 
kids are still playing. I don't care what age you are. I still play. I have one game I play all the time. I say, yeah, it's good for my mind. Keeps my mind alert, right? Well, everybody plays something somehow. I swim. I, isn't that playing? This is part of life. Um, there's rules. There's rituals. There's team play. There's quiet play. And there's things that we do alone to do well, like playing that piano or that organ or that instrument or whatever that is. They're developing a sense of self-concept. Who am I? What can I do? And what do I look like? They're going to start wanting maybe a girl likes colored brits in their hair. Or maybe they start blowing their hair dry out, their hair out, right? All those things to be prettier. Or maybe, you know, their school uniforms are taken. Maybe um, their individuality comes with the color socks they wear. I mean, it could be anything, but they're starting to be aware of who they are, their abilities, their values, and their appearance. Now, you're not the only adult as a parent that's going to be taking care of these children. It's also teachers and principals or sports people. So these people also need to be a positive influence on them. Um, that positive influence gives them a good feeling and then these kids are happy and self-confident. Now, body image is mostly adolescent, but as we get older in the school age, all of a sudden we're starting to notice all of these different things. We're starting to notice that, you know, I've got the most beautiful blue eyes or look at my long eyelashes, right? When you're a kid, you're starting to know those things and you're going to see differences in children, you know, kids that are bigger, smaller, taller, you know, shorter, one who wears glasses, hearing aids, braces. You're starting to notice all of these things and all of these differences. Now, sometimes children, because they need glasses or they need a hearing aid or braces, they might feel a feeling of inferiority. Again, this is where the parents come in, you know, to help get them through that time. Now, as we have a little, you know, kid, six years old, we're getting into school, right? It's starting that structure that they have to get up at a time, they have to eat breakfast, they got to get dressed, they got to get to school, and they've got to sit at that desk and do whatever that teacher does, and then they can come home, right? So this is a structure. They have to be... Um, emotionally and socially able to do those things and get along with other kids too. This is the other part of um, socialization. You have family or your family, friends, relatives, whatever, but school is that other place. So remember, in school, you have children that are not like your children. They have a different value culture. They're starting to see these differences. And you're going to start seeing as they get older within school age that peer relationships are very important. Now, school age is an important time, again, to mention nutrition. Now, we've mentioned it since, you know, uh, infants, right? Nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. Well, remember, you can go both ways at school age. You could be too heavy, too skinny, right? And it, again, it does affect cognition and motor and all of that. It still does affect it. But remember, um, with food, we have to remember that today, one of the things that we see is two parents have to make an income to get a household supported. I mean, rarely can one person support a household in the manner they want to. So mom comes home, dad comes home, they're tired. They get home at seven o'clock at night and now it's making dinner. So what is the easiest thing to do? Let's drive through something and get it or call up and get Uber here with Uber Eats or whatever. Let's get some food going. And usually it's fast food. Now, fast food sometimes is okay. But remember, fast food is high calorie, high fat, and it could create problems with a school age child. My plate is a program that's in the online that children can look at, seeing if they're eating the proper food groups. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that can happen in school age is obesity. And it is reaching epidemic proportions. And the reason is kids are not going outside. Whether it's because they wanna stay in and play their games or 
they don't have a neighborhood they can go out in because that's part of it that some children do. Now, a school-age child who becomes obese does have a risk for high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol because of all of these cardiometabolic changes within their body. So when do we need to hit this obesity thing and teach children? School age. They are a great age to teach. So early education has shown to prevent this obesity. Now, when also can we start with uh, teaching about obesity? Well, it's when mom's pregnant with the child, starting there and then through infancy. Again, why do we do height and weight on every child, every visit, all the way through, you know, up to 18? It's just what we do in order to see, are they getting proper nutrition or are they getting too much nutrition, right? Now, Childhood obesity is all ethnic groups. It doesn't hit one or the other. It's everybody. And we know school-age children love to learn. I mean, I remember one of the programs was there to keep kids off drugs. And they would come home and tell me, I smoked cigarettes way back then. Nope, mom, put that cigarette out. They want to pull it out of my mouth and break it. Well, I want you to know last week has been 15 years that I quit smoking. And I was about two packs a day. All of a sudden, one day I put it down. That was it. I was done. I'd had enough. I, I just tired of being tired and wanting a cigarette, right? Now, school-age children were a part of that and my children. And then, of course, now being a grandparent, you don't want to have those things around them. Now, one of the things we tend to do, and I see it, you know, even with my grandson, but my grandson is a peanut. He's this big. So he actually needs to finish his food. But what about that kid who never can get off the table unless they finish all the food on their plate? What are you saying? As they get to be adults, what are they going to continue to do? They're going to eat all the food on their plate because mommy said they're starving kids and wherever, right? That's what mom and dad has always said to everybody. So if a kid is full, they're full. But say, well, then no dessert or no snack later whatever it is, but um, don't make a kid finish a plate. Now, school age, they still need sleep, but as you can see, it is not as much. Now, the beginning of school age, they're gonna fight about going to the school to sleep, just like your preschooler, same thing. But as they get older, they're gonna say, mom, I'm going to bed, I'm tired. And it, there's not gonna be as much problems with it. Sports. You know, sports are great. You know, um, there's Little League. I know me and my family of my parents. My father was even a coach in Little League. I had six brothers, though. We had to keep those kids busy, right? I was a little girl cheerleader. So I used to dress in cute little things, <laughs> cheering. And she gave me those little whatever. But sports, very important. Now, the problem with sports, though, again, is the bullying and being emotionally uh, and socially mature to be able to be competitive. Some kids just can't tolerate losing. And that's not what sports are for. Sports are for to participate as a team together to do the best you can do. If you win, oh, that's the best. But if you lose, it's not for you to be angry and be mad, right? Or stomping your feet and yelling and screaming. Kids love competition. They want to be the best at whether it's a video game, whether it's a game you're playing, a table game, card game, they want to win. But um, it, it's a good thing for them to get into. But again, parents need to be there for this. Now, dental health. As I said, six years old, teeth are falling out. Your permanent teeth are coming in. So good dental hygiene is very important. Now, Yes, every kid should brush their teeth and floss before they go to bed. But kids, the younger school age, up to about age seven, which is first grade, they don't have the dexterity to do that flossing. So don't expect it. They should brush their teeth in the morning and before they go to bed. And if you see a kid losing their teeth, that means they're not getting good dental care. 
So prevention of dental caries, again, making sure they brush their teeth before they go to bed, no sweets, drinks, you know, during the eat nighttime. Um, periodontal disease, you know, that bottle mouth, my, my son had, because he had the bottle in his mouth forever and he had those black teeth. And of course the gums were going with it. Um, we didn't know better that many years ago. And then of course we have those good old braces. Um, they're doing a lot of good things with braces today. It's not as much as a tinsel mouth as it used to be in my age. Now they got those clear things. So it's not as bad, right? And then dental injury. I think the one thing I've seen is the two front teeth cracked or completely expelled out of their mouth. Usually it's the swimming pool. They get up, they slip, their mouth comes and goes on the side of the pool. There goes a tooth. Or on the um, jungle gyms, same thing, tooth, it comes out. What would you do if a whole tooth fell out of a kid's mouth? What would you tell a parent? Well, if this is a permanent tooth, you want to save that tooth, especially if the root's attached, right? Because to put in a post and a tooth and all of that is a lot, a lot of money and a lot of aggravation and time spent. Now, if it comes out, the root is there, you put it in cold milk. Why cold milk? I think the cold keeps it from getting infected. Milk has to do with calcium. I don't know, but that's what they say to put it in. It works and get yourself either to a pediatric um, dentist or go to a pediatric emergency room. And what they do is they just numb the area and they push it back in. And then they'll have you eating soft foods. And many of them re-adhere. And you have stopped from getting this post and tooth and dental surgery, et cetera, et cetera. It does work. And that is when the whole tooth comes out. Sex education, you know, they're still, you know, exploring themselves. They're still, you know, playing with themselves, seeing what this is, all curiosity with it. Um, when we start teaching these children, they say about middle childhood. So somewhere about age eight, nine is somewhere we can start talking about sex education, again, on the level of the child um, and letting them know about menstruation and, you know, what is a period? I mean, for instance, me, my mother signed a consent. I could watch a movie in school. I went to the auditorium, all of us girls. We watched this movie from 1950. I have no clue what it was talking about. I had a picture of ovaries and eggs falling in. I didn't know about bleeding. And my mother told me nothing. So when I started bleeding, guess what? I was a little scared, right? So this would be something that parents need to be encouraged to talk to their child about so that they can ask them questions as they go onward. Now, nurses, you know, being a school nurse is great. And many of you who have children or want children, it, you'll be on the same schedule as your kids, which is a great thing to be. You know, summer's off, Christmas is off, you know, and school nurse is actually a great thing to do. Um, you're in charge of all of these kids and giving them the information they need. Now, what do we need to do about these children? Well, number one, if they start asking you about sex, the first thing to find out is what do they know about? Tell me what you think sex is so that you're on the same page because they may not understand what we know about sex. And again, having maybe brochures or flyers, you know, asking those questions um, for that child so that they're not gonna be afraid. And again, trying for them to have that open communication with parents. And as a school nurse, you let the parents know your child was here today, was asking about sex. And this is what I did. You know, if you can uh, continue that at home, right? It will help. <clears throat> What does that school nurse do? I think when COVID came, those school nurses were in overdrive. Think about it. All of a sudden we had a you know, public emergency. Uh, protecting the kids is what they do. Yes, they do health appraisals, education, um, those communicable diseases, making sure that there's outbreaks, that the parents knew about it. 
Um, I know that we've had kids come in with bacterial meningitis. We had to send notices to the school nurse to let them know so they can tell those parents of those children that might have been in contact in order to get a prophylactic antibiotic, right? So school nurses, they do a lot, a lot, a lot, and they're very invaluable to um, children and making sure that they're safe. Now, injury prevention, we always worry about kids getting injured, right? Most common is always cars, whether they're in the car, not in the car seat, in the car seat, inappropriate car seat, or ran over by a car. I have seen several children ran over, backed over by a car, a Jeep, a truck um, by accident. And mostly they're due to family members that we've seen. I've seen them run over and nothing happened. And I've seen the absolute opposite where, you know, they had multitude of injuries. So car accident is always number one. As I said earlier, a risk factor for injuries is going to be a stressful family environment. Stressful family environments make kids do things that maybe they wouldn't have done because they're angry, they're upset. They should be children in the rear seat by still 13 years old. I mean, I was a single parent. My children were nine and 11. And I still remember today, they used to call shotgun who was going to sit in the front seat with me as we're driving along, right? Well, I did wrong. They should have been both in the rear seat till they were 13. This is showing you how things have evolved for safety for children, you know, over the last several years. Booster seats, they should be in till they're eight years old. Um, they're not ready for them to be in a car sitting there, just a um, seat belt because they need a little bit more support still up to age eight. Now, I live in Homestead, Florida. The Everglades is right over there. There are ATVs always going up this one major street into all the fields. And that's what kids love to do. They love their ATVs. Now, the one thing they say, children under 16 should not be manning that ATV because mommy can't watch them, can she? They take off when they're in a the field and now they're over this behind there and they're gone. So you don't know what they're doing and they're very dangerous. If children are riding bikes, they should have the appropriate equipment on. Minimum that helmet, you know, hitting their head on the ground, concussions, right? A lot of things can happen. Um, all the sports need to have appropriate safety equipment. Skates, skateboards, scooters, all of them. And they say, and my kids always wanted one and I would never do it, trampoline, highest injury for ages five to 14. You know, they've made them a little bit safer in the recent years, but still they can break their necks on a, a trampoline. Now, parents. Parents have these children and they have been protected, nurtured. You tell them what to do, how to do it and kept them safe, right? Now they're school-age children. They're getting friends, right? They're same-sex peer friends. Now they're doing a little more than they used to do. So parents need to give that independence to the child. And watching, but the kid doesn't need to know how closely you're watching. Because you are letting that child grow, getting ready for the final outcome when they are beyond adolescence, is to go to college, move out move into their own places, right? You're letting them deal with the world. Now, one of the common things that can happen in children is ADHD. And basically when we talk about ADHD is a child who can't sit and cannot finish a task. It's hyperactivity. They just inattentive. They go from one thing to another thing and usually these children will disturb a whole classroom. Many times these children, it continues up into kindergarten, first grade, and, you know, and it's creating problems for the other children to learn. So these teachers send them to the school nurse. Now as a school nurse, what is your job? Well, number one, 
you need to find out what's going on with the child and what do they think, but then bring in the parents and have some sort of parent meeting. Now, just because they have ADHD, a lot of people, um, teachers, think that they're just spoiled kids who don't want to listen, right? But that's not always the case. So when the parents come in, give them an opportunity to explain what they have done, what they have tried to do for that child. And then when they're done explaining all the things they've done, then make a plan. Because we don't know as nurses what they've done or not. Don't assume they've done nothing. Many parents are at their end. They've done everything and they do need your help. So child has had a Vols knocked out tooth. The parents are reluctant to try to reimplant the tooth. Where should the tooth be placed for transport? In cold milk. Yeah, absolutely. Why? I'm not totally sure, but it works. And now let's go into adolescence. I call this the roller coaster ride. Adolescents are starting out as kids and they're ending up adults in the end. So there's so much going on in their brains, right? It is a rapid physical, cognitive, social, emotional maturation. So it starts with the beginning of their secondary sex characteristics, which means girls, nipple buds, boys, an enlarged testicle. Those are the beginnings of puberty. <clears throat> and then it ends body growth about 18 to 20 years. Now, I sort of say it doesn't end up growing at 20 years. I had a son, I sent him to the army at age 19. He was 5'7 and 147 pounds. He came home two years later. He was six foot four and 220 pounds. And all I could say was, thank goodness somebody else was feeding you, because I don't know how you got that big. And today, he's still about the same. We know primary sex characteristics is what you're going to use to reproduce. But those secondary are starting those hormonal changes. You know, we all hear voice changes in males and females. The hair is going to start to grow and armpits and you know, on their pubic areas, on their face, all over the place. Girls are going to start getting breasts, and now those fat deposits going to make us curvy, right? Has nothing to do with having a baby. As I said, boys is testicular enlargement. Girls, the first pubescent change is breast buds. And remember, this will follow Tanner's stages of uh, development, okay? If you haven't heard of Tanner's, it's in your book. It's also, you'll see it on the PowerPoint for your study guide too. You know, girls and boys, you know, right there at the beginning of adolescence should be getting their three dose series of the HPV virus. And if they haven't had hepatitis B or HBV, it also should be started. Um, we didn't do hepatitis for many years and we've just started it. So hasn't been done, we can give them both now. This is your tanners and what you see. You know, you start out with girls and you talk about, you know, you're starting with the breast buds and you'll end up with full breasts and hair where there should be incurvation. This is all what you're going to see here, okay? And you see the testicles on boys are getting bigger and their penis is getting bigger and of course hair again. So there are stages, five stages for each um, Tanner stage of development in boys or in girls. Again, when we are talking about adolescence, this is that pre-adolescent or adolescent growth spurt. Uh, growth spurt. This is at those that younger age of the adolescent and you are gonna see a child go 20 to 25% of their height is gonna be achieved in this two to three year period. These kids are getting tall, which means they need nutrition now, right? Just like the infants, this, this age really does need good nutrition. So they grow and they're healthy with it. Um, we know that obesity can um, happen sometimes with the beginning, the hormones and you know the menarche. 
uh, obesity in boys, we don't know as much. And as I said, boys changes for both. So here we go, Erickson. Now, Erickson talks about who am I, my identity, which means body image, which means what do I want to be when I grow up? which means body image. I don't like my hair. I'm too fat. I'm too skinny. I have too many pimples. I don't like this, this, that, the other, right? Do I like girls? Do I like boys? Do I like both? Do I like none? All of these things as adolescents, your mind is trying to figure out who you are, right? Now, one of the things that Erickson talks about and understanding there's all this turmoil going on, on these adolescents because of sense of identity is any warning signs of suicide should be taken seriously. And you might see sleep disturbance, irritability, change in appetite, social withdrawal. It means they're not going out anymore. And maybe they're talking about death. And even if they say, my friend has said he wants to commit suicide, you need to take it seriously. It is a call for help. Social development, <clears throat> well, they're finding their identity, but they don't want mommy to be around and they don't want daddy to tell them what to do, right? They want to be independent from any authority, but they want the $20 to go to the movie, right? Or they need this for mom to do that. Or as they get older and get driver's license, can I borrow the car? But they want to do what they want when they want. That's that independence they're looking for. And because of this, and they do have to answer to mom and dad, there's a lot of ambivalence with it. Now, very important that adolescents be accepted by their peers, whether it's the band group, the nerd group, whether it's the sports group, the art group, the whatever group, are they accepted? When they're accepted, they feel good. And again, body image is so important to these um, adolescents. They want to feel good about the way that they look. As I said, these roles from the parents to the children are now changing. They don't want that guidance anymore. So it starts with parents trying to protect them. So now you're just holding on to the roller coaster ride, okay? They want to do what they want to do. And it's a, a real struggle. Teenagers struggle with privileges and responsibility, as in, you know, you're not getting the car because I asked you to do, do, do this week and you got a D on your exam. Why should I give you the car? Privileges are earned, you know, so this is something they have a hard time with. What they say is ages 15 to 17, there's major conflicts over independence and control over their responsibilities and the relationship with their parents. Now, what do we suggest adolescents do with parents? And sometimes this is so hard. Have them sit together and build a contract of what each other is willing to do. Well, okay, you can stay out to 12, not 11, but you have to be home at 12. Or you can have the car if you do, 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 do or whatever it is. Build those limits, that structure, encourage parents to talk to their children. And if you look at that picture, they're not looking, not listening, not uncommon with adolescents. Now, their relationships are with peers, so important. This is where they start talking and let everything out that they're feeling, right? It's um, very important to have that peer or that perfect best friend, right? Best friends are so important at this. They, and usually they're same sex at this point. The one thing about best friends and adolescents, the way that they treat their best friend and adolescent is usually how they're going to treat their partner in life. Isn't that amazing? So if you have great best friends, you're still best friends, that's usually how you're going to be with your relationships. So uh, one of the things um, about best friends that's so important, again, it gives them a sense of belonging. They need their approval. Now, as a nurse, how are you going to get that adolescent to open up with you? Very hard. And adolescents will try to shock you. That is for absolute sure. So you need to somehow build up that adolescent, uh, build up that rapport. It could be, you know, they come in listening to music, asking them what, 
what music they like to listen to or asking them, you know, what they're doing in school or if it's something with sports, tell me about sports. What position do you play? Start something, open up that sort of thing, right? Another thing is sometimes you'll see girls dressing sort of like a male, you know, have the shorter hair, the clothes that are more masculine. Number one, these children are expressing themselves. So to say, what name would you like me to call you? I mean, the name on the record might say Rachel, but they want to be called Ray. So if you do that, call them by Ray, they're going to be more open and talk with you. Another thing, remember, when they're telling you different things, they're going to do things that they shock. They're, the shock value they're looking for, trying to maintain that face like it, you're not shocked, and they'll continue telling you things. As I said, that three shot HPV or HBV is recommended, um, and girls and boys get them too. Nutrition, you know, adolescents are busy. They're always on the go. So they're getting a bottle of water and a power bar, and they're going. Or many of them just fast food it all the way through and snack, 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 right? So again, um, teaching adolescents to eat properly is good. If they don't get enough or too much, one of the things we can do is ask them to keep a 24-hour diary of the food. And we could see maybe there's different choices that they can make. Now, adolescents, remember the beginning they're growing a lot like infants. They should sleep a lot, but they don't. Why not? Well, their buddies and them, you're talking all night, texting all night on the phone, or it's school, you have a project due, or, you know, there's, you know, this uh, really great basketball game and we got to go and we've got to cheer our team on, or there's an after party. So there's no time to sleep with adolescents because all of these activities disrupt it. So we, they need to get as much as they can. They should be active, they should exercise. And again, brushing their teeth, very important, keeping those teeth good. You know, sexuality should be coming from a good source, but you know, today, TV, movies, <laughs> you can find anything you want on TV today, right? You have one of those sticks, and let me tell you, you can find some crazy stuff on the TV today. So um, make sure that the parents know what these kids are watching and that they do get information from reliable sources. Now, what they say about giving information on sex um, and even contraceptive, the school nurse should be just given oral and written information. You know, so that they, not what you think, like selling them, be celibate. You know, an adolescent is going to do what they want, but we can give them good information and they can make better choices than nothing at all, right? And of course, there's Planned Parenthood still around, so hopefully um, they can use that. Safety, again, we're talking an injury, motor vehicles. Well, now they're driving. So now it's even more injuries going on there. So um, it's part of it. They are starting to get a little bit braver. They're touching whoever's gun and it's going off and we're having accidents. They want to, their competition, they want to be good. They're having injuries, you know, so uh, making sure that they do warm up and use proper equipment, protective equipment is very important. So you have a 14 year old. Remember, beginning of the adolescence seems to be always eating, although his weight is appropriate for his height. The best explanation for this is what? What happens in the beginning of adolescence? The adolescent growth spurt, right? Is it A? Absolutely. It's absolutely A. They're getting taller and the weight is going. They have to eat if they're doing it that quickly. Good. Any questions so far? You like your school-aging adolescent kids, right? 
All I can tell you with adolescents, I raised them, is just holding on for the roller coaster ride. They're not going to like you as teenagers, but I have to say that I am blessed. I've got my best friend as my daughter now and my son, but I held on to the roller coaster. And they now understand why I said no all the time. Let's go ahead and do our cahoots. You know, I found out that little Q code there, if you click on it, it'll go right to Kahoot. I never knew that. I learned that Friday. Did it work, Kelly? I just found that out. Somebody in my PN class said, oh, no, if you take it and you just do the Q code, poop, there it is. I'm like, really? I've only been playing Kahoot's for five years, okay? I love learning stuff that is new. <clears throat> All right, let's get going. Week three, school age and adolescent. How does the onset of puberty growth spurt compare in boys and girls? So we know that puberty starts, we know girls are before boys, because remember boys are stupid at that age, so 10 for girls, 12 for boys. And I grew up with six brothers, so <laughs> they wouldn't want me to say they were stupid. <laughs> A multi. What activities are appropriate for a six-year-old child? So remember, you're at the beginning of school age. Remember industry, right? Something they can do. So organized sports may be a lot. They are not always able to do like other kids. They might get frustrated. Solitary card game, they don't know how to do that yet. But riding a bike, jumping a rope, these are things they can do. They can succeed. And that is part of industry, as Erickson says. At what age should a parent expect to have major conflicts over independence and control with their child? I love that picture. He's like, mom, shut up. I don't care anymore, right? And that is ages 15 to 17, okay? 11, they're too young. Remember, they're still pleasers at 11, 12. It's a little older, 15 to 17. They've grown up, they've gotten bigger. You know, they want their independence then. That's when they fight for it. Signs of onset of puberty in girls. What do you see first? Breast buds, first thing, girls, it's like little breast buds. Again, know that Tanner stages of development before your HESI, before your NCLEX. These are questions they love. They love Tanners. The onset of puberty in boys is characterized by. I mean, we have secondary changes that go on, but the one physical thing that we do see is testicular enlargement, okay? The voice changes, it's part of it, but it's that physical of testicular enlargement, it's the onset of puberty. What do we use to determine if a female has reached the age of menarche? Now, 
know, when you talk about Menarche and the physical description of what girls go through, the only thing it can be is Tanner staging. Okay, we can look at Tanner staging, seeing what the girl looks like, and we can see, are they stage one, two, three, four, or five? And we can predict what's next. A child goes to the ER with a low fever, puritic grass, and open oozing papulas. Nursing care includes. What do you think that could be when you see that open oozing papules? Little fever. Well, when you have a rash, and you see a fever and you don't know what it is, you better put on a mask. Probably that's chicken pox. Now, does it mean because you had a varicella vaccine that you're not going to get chicken pox? No, you still can get chicken pox if you've had the vaccine. OK, so protect yourself at all times. You know, the one thing in 10 years, I always protected myself and no kid gave me a strep throat or flu or any of those things because I wore gloves and I wore a mask and I protected myself. And the reason why negative pressure room, chicken pox is airborne. So we wanna protect the rest of the children in the environment. The source of injury, whether intentional or unintentional in adolescence is associated with what? Can I say of any age child? Motor vehicle accidents. Motor vehicle are always your, when you have, in, well, intentional, they walk in front of them, but usually it's the unintentional with them. If a parent feels uncomfortable talking about sex education, who's a good resource? So your school nurse, you can see how valuable your school nurse can be, that they can be there and that person. I mean, my parents, there's something I never talked about, and it would have been nice to have somebody to talk to. I had six brothers. What are they going to tell me? You know, that's not a person I should go to because boys and girls have different views, right? A nine-year-old friend tells him soccer is a dumb game and he should play baseball. What is that all about? nine-year-old, school age. And then you're talking about a friend, which means the same sex peer. And it's all about peer acceptance, same sex peer, peer acceptance. And most likely he'll play baseball because he wants to be with his friend, right? So these are things that happen to school age children. As much as he wants to play soccer, he'll play baseball to be with his friend. During admission of a, the father of a 16 year old says we're Buddhist and culturally competent care includes. So, all right, we're Buddhist. What does that mean? How do I treat this child, this father? You know, cultural, there's so many cultures out there. Now, the one thing you need to say is, is there any preferences? I mean, it could be dietary, right? Now, another thing is you need to also say to the child, what would you like? Is there any changes for you? We always ask the parents, but this is a 16 year old who can make up his own decision, right? You should also ask them to, but always ask for preferences. It could be they only want a female caregiver or a male caregiver or a diet or whatever it is. When teaching sex education and contraceptive for adolescents, what should the nurse consider?
<clears throat> so if we're teaching, remember our own opinions, our own values shouldn't surface. What we need to do is give them oral information and written also so that they can go back and they can read it too. We don't tell them, you know, well, why are you having sex? No, they're still going to. So give them what you could understand, maybe refer them somewhere, um, and also in written form, any brochures, et cetera. A multi. The management of adolescent obesity should include <clears throat> Remember I told you about adolescents and the way they eat, they're just so sporadic. So the, one of the ways that we can um, manage it is to figure out what are they eating in a day, right? Also, you've got to give them that reward. It might be on Sundays, they can have a scoop of maybe low calorie ice cream if that's what they want. Something to look forward to. Using nutritious foods as a method of reward. An adolescent don't want no nutritious food. They want that what they want, right? So that's not a reward for them. And diversions is more the younger kids. Adolescents are not being having diversion. It's not going to work. Infants go through a predictable sequence of growth and development. This is called. I'll always give you stuff from a week or so before. And see if you're keeping up with it. Predictable sequence of growth and development. And it is sequential trends. You know, a lot of students say, but sequence, sequence, that was too easy. Don't overthink. Sometimes the answers are that easy. Good job. Which benchmark serves as the ending period for school age children? So six is the beginning of their teeth being lost. At the end is what? Right before they start adolescence. <clears throat> it's the onset of puberty. And then all of their permanent teeth are in, okay? That is it. Wisdom teeth don't have that there. Which action would improve dental health in the school age child? <clears throat> and of course, trying to have them floss. Remember younger school age children First and first grade and kindergartners, they don't have the dexterity, but older kids should be encouraged, and that's going to help with dental health. Generally, the earliest age at which puberty begins is Ten and girls, 12 and boys. Very good. An eight-year-old girl says that she has cancer because God is punishing her for being bad. This just like my appendix is bursting because I was bad. I hit my sister yesterday. What does that mean? <clears throat> Absolutely common. This is absolutely common that the, you know, the younger of the school age children think that something I did wrong and I'm being punished for it. It's a common belief for these children. A six-year-old needs to get a chest x-ray. What explanation is the best? I'm gonna do a chest x-ray. I'm gonna send you to the radiology department. I'll see you when you get back. Tell a six-year-old that. The technician is going to use a camera and take a picture and look at your insides. And again, as a nurse, 
taking 30 seconds, opening an x-ray and letting the kids see it is going to save years of distress. So I always have done that for my kids. How do you get an adolescent to open up about their sexual history? <clears throat> and then many times you'll have adolescents come in, they're in urinary tract infections, especially girls, one of the things. And we know that it could be a possibility due to, you know, sexual practices, right? How are you going to get that, that adolescent to talk to you? Well, number one, you're going to do something to ask them about their social life. What do they want to be when they grow up? What do you do for fun? What music do you like? All of these things will open it up and then they probably will talk to you. Remember, adolescents, you can tell the parents to leave and be in the room and they can tell you what's going on. Now, you do not have to tell the parents what they said unless what they told you could hurt themselves or others. So it's sort of held in confidence. They're having sex, then um, there's something that we would discuss with that girl. How do you get an adolescent to be more receptive to talking about their health and sexual exploration? And just have those parents leave the room. And then they can talk to you. Again, they're going to tell you things that are going to try to shock you. So be prepared for it. A multi. When educating adolescents about risk for HIV and hepatitis, what would you include? <clears throat> so yes we're going to tell them they should be abstinent we know may or may not happen hand washing we think of something like that yes it's part of it but absolutely using condoms for that protection um, at least that's something they should do a child is a knocked out tooth where should that tooth be placed for transport to the dentist And that's in your cold milk and bring them there. You know, I've seen many a kid get a tooth, tooth put in and they take this numbing gel and put it and squeeze it in there as much as they can and leave it there for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, making sure it's numb. And then the doctor comes in and takes it and just pushes it down and holds it and, and you know, sort of wiggles it into place. And the kids don't complain of pain. It's just more of the pushing. They're like, Ugh. so you're like holding the head and pushing it at the same time. And most of these children, these tooth do re-implant and they're on these soft diets for several days after. A nurse planning care for a school-aged child should know which thought process is seen. What did I tell you about school age? This is part, you know, of Piaget. And what he says about this. And that's an ability to conserve, okay? Magical thinking is preschoolers. They're conserving, which means that water in a short squat glass or the tall one, you pour it in, it's still the same. I mean, the word conserve can be confusing. Big thing of uh, uh, clay, squishing it, it's still the same amount. Putting coins in different sequence, it's still the same amount. This is conserve, according to Piaget. What stage of Erickson would you use for a school age child? <clears throat> Remember, it's all about what they, what task they can do and do well, and then all the other stuff they can't. It's industry, the task they do well,
versus inferiority. Autonomy versus shame and doubt, that's your toddlers. That means autonomous, me, 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 mine, mine. I want to do it, do it. And then shame and doubt is mom saying, don't do that. Watch out, don't hurt yourself. Don't let them do things so they have that shame and doubt. School-age children's moral development. <laughs> That's Kohlberg. What does Kohlberg say? So we know doing right or wrong is based on the consequences. That's the younger kids. That's preschoolers. You know, that's even your toddlers. School-age children knows right, knows wrong, and conforms and does the right thing because they want to please. They love to please the adults, you know, whoever is in charge. They want to please. A multi. Anorexia nervosa is characterized by, you know, eating disorders. I didn't have time to go over it in a PowerPoint. So I'm going to be giving you two different eating disorders and discussing them and basically giving you the overview. Anorexia nervosa, what is that? Anorexia nervosa is when they don't eat anything. They're afraid to even drink water. It's a fear of any weight gain at all. Severe, severe calorie restriction. They have one leaf of lettuce and some water and they think they've done well. Because of what? The unrealistic body image. Even in their mind and they're 80 pounds, they still feel fat. Now, vomiting and purging is the other eating disorder. How do you know if you suffer from bulimia? The other eating disorder. Binge eating and purging. Now, how would you know if a child was anorexia nervosa or binging from binge eating and purging with bulimia? Well, when you vomit, you vomit stomach acid, right? You're going to have rotten teeth from all that acid in your stomach coming up. So both could be very skinny, but the one with rotten teeth is the one who's vomiting and purging. Okay, you understand that, makes sense. Adolescents are. <clears throat> Adolescents, ages 12 through 18. Most pediatric hospitals say up to age 21. They're stuck somewhere. They start as a kid, they go to an adult, you know, and they're confused, they're troubled, they're frustrated. It's a really, really difficult time of life. They're trying to figure everything out. What is an adolescent's heart rate? Well, we've learned what the infants are. What are adolescents? What do you think works here? They're almost adults, you know, their hearts are beating more efficiently. And it's somewhere like 55 to 90. You know, adult, you know, when you talk adults, it's 60 to 100. Adolescents, they're more efficient, more effective, they're more active. So 55 to 90 is a common one for them. When talking with an adolescent regarding personal health concerns, which is most important? You know, you need to let them talk. You need to let them say what they want to say. And then again, be prepared for them to say things that they're going to try to blow your mind because that's what adolescents do. But you just say, okay, mm -hmm, sure. Oh, wow, okay. And that's what I would do, even if I'm shocked. A parent says the infant puts everything in their mouth. Based on Freud's theory, how would you respond with that? 
Why are they putting everything in their mouth? What does Freud say? They explore the world in their mouths. Very good. Yeah, I throw some of those questions in. Multi. What could be a sign of potential child abuse? You know, I've seen child abuse a couple times. Uh, one was lack of nutrition. Uh, one was physical abuse that was really horrible. Um, again, when you're talking child abuse, your job as a nurse is to protect the child. Remember, protect the child. That's your job. What you're going to see is some inconsistency between the injuries noted and the history. Again, you try to have the child tell you what happened. Say it's a broken arm, broken leg, whatever. Again, your job as a nurse is to make sure that child is safe, okay? So seeing a different story, seeing a kid just not really worried, you know, afraid to talk, something's going on there. If they're concerned, well, that's what we want to see. Uh, but even if they've done it, you'll see them concerned. So again, the inconsistency that you'll see. In addition to injuries, the leading cause of death in adolescents ages 15 to 19 are <clears throat> we know motor vehicles will always be there. What's the other stuff? And it's you know, homicide, suicide, it could be they're in the gangs, could be they picked up a gun and it shot somebody. But again, suicide is a big concern of adolescents. So remember, always take it seriously. In school age, conflict of industry versus inferiority. What does industry mean? It's they're mastering a task, which means they'll do something and do it well. I mean, I was great at math. I was great at spelling. I was good at sports. I was good at ballet. What was I bad at? Well, I didn't write the way I wanted to. I wanted to be neater or whatever it was. It's mastering a task that makes me feel great. That's my industry. Again, remember as a nurse, Never ask a school-aged child to do something that you do not think they can succeed at because that causes that frustration of inferiority. Which age group prefers to be with members of their own sex? <clears throat> That's your school-aged children and it's the end of school age the seven to 11 year olds, 12 to 14, they're, that one doesn't matter, it's boys or girls, but same sex peers is in school age and it's at the end of school age. True or false, home support is invaluable to the adolescent. Do they need mom and dad? Or they don't want mom and dad? It's an ambivalence, isn't it? <clears throat> They do need them, okay? What if something happens? Who are they gonna run home to? Who's gonna give them support? It should be mom and dad. No matter what turmoil they're in, they still need mom and dad to be there when they need them. It is invaluable. And the adolescent needs to know mom and dad is there, no matter what's going on. Because you know, adolescents wanna do what they want. What clinical finding does not indicate an adolescent may be suffering from anorexia nervosa? What finding does not indicate an adolescent suffering from anorexia nervosa? Remember, bulimia is the teeth. And when you talk about anorexia nervosa, they're not vomiting. They're just not eating. But when you look at these things, dry skin, intolerance to code, constipation, isn't that all about hypothyroidism also? They're not getting fuel. So they're not getting the hormones and food source they need. Very similar, but those teeth. 14-year-olds in the ED after a biking accident 
How should the nurse interact with this child? You know, I was a trauma nurse, primary trauma nurse for many years. And it was my job to be with that kid who came in. What did I need to do? Remember primary, you're in there. It was my job to take care of the kid. So I'm explaining everything and letting them ask questions because everybody's gonna be running in at once. You're gonna have x-ray coming in. You're gonna have surgeons coming in. ER physicians coming in. We're gonna be starting IVs. We're gonna do this, do this, do that. So that kid's gonna be afraid. So letting them know and encouraging questions is exactly what we need to do. What is cooperative play? And kids are working together, using the same toys, same things, and there's going to be a goal, whether they're building a, you know, a fort, a tower, a sandcastle, the goal is this, working together, that's cooperative. Good job. What does moral development involve? Now think of moral, always think of Kohlberg. And what does Kohlberg say? So understanding morality or the development of what you need to understand. And that is right and wrong and there's consequences. Remember, it evolves as they get older and school-age children now want to please. They know right and wrong, but they want to do things right because they want to please. Developmental milestones are important to observe because of what? Now, this is the one about your infants and even your toddlers. A toddler's not speaking more than two words by two years old. I mean, why is that important to observe? Because we can institute early intervention or we can do prevention. And as I said before, children catch up quick. The quicker we can put in early intervention, that speech, the occupational, physical therapy, those kids do catch up quick. So that's why we observe those things. Lymph nodes in children with normal findings, what it should look like. Should not be able to feel them at all. Good job. Depriving a child of food, clothing, and shelter. What is that called? Education. Food, clothing, shelter, education, love. It's called neglect. You know, there, there was this one TV uh, thing that I've seen where kids are outside playing in the front yard with a ball. And the ball went into the street. The kid almost got hit. Somehow the cops were called and the, it was 32 degrees outside. And when the police came, these children were not in coats. So they didn't have proper clothing and they were up for child neglect because the kid didn't have a coat on. Can you imagine? That was called neglect. Which of the following immunizations is given in the adolescent age? And that's your HPV or HBV. Varicella is usually given about 15 to 18 months, okay? Remember varicella is a live vaccine. What do you know about live vaccines and how you should give them? Well, if you're immunosuppressed, you shouldn't get them, right? The other thing is, what if you're on steroids? You're immunosuppressed. You should not get them also, okay? Something we don't remember, that's actually a med surge 2 question that you'll be listening to about live vaccines and who shouldn't get them, just to let you know. ADHD most likely involves which of the following?
inattention, distraction, impulsivity, hyperactivity, can't sit, can't finish anything, and it's like creates disturbances within classrooms. Very good. A multi. An adolescent's been brought to the ER with a drug overdose. What is the initial questions that you need to ask this adolescent? Like part of your assessment, your interview, what do you need to know? What's important? How are you gonna treat this adolescent? Very good. Rehab, they're not talking rehab yet. They're, they're like, no, they're still with their drug. When did you take them? What did you do and how? Did you take it, you know, intranasally? Did you give yourself a shot, give it IV? Did you just take a pill? What did you do? Very important questions that you would ask this adolescent because it's how you're going to treat them. Because if you gave it IV, it's going to wear off quicker, believe it or not. So we need to know these things, and especially if it's an opioid type thing, so that we know when should be the ending of, the, you know, the cycle of that drug. And last question, adolescents typically place blank on peer relationships. And they just like to be with their buddies, for sure. Number three, Kim, good job, Kim. Number two, Ashley, good job, Ashley. Number one. Adria, the whole way through, good job. And Becca and Gray, good job, guys. Okay, any questions, comments, concerns? The one thing I want you to know is I might have to have a combined class next week for the exam. I've got a new professor. So I don't want her to be alone during the exam and all of us full-time people are giving uh, an exam and have um, you know, uh, our own classes that week. If I send you another Zoom link, it'll be only for the exam and then you'll come back to me afterwards, okay? But I will let you know and I will very clearly describe that to you. It's only to help another professor. What do we as nurses do? We help each other. We want the best for each other, right? In case of situation. So it's just another thing that we do even in education. So just to let you know, you're probably seeing that. I'm actually talking to her in just a little bit as she's concerned and worried. So next week, remember, come in on your cell phones and we'll do our little scan of your environment. Make sure you have your ID, whether it's a driver's license or your school ID and only a whiteboard. Ho hopefully most of you have a whiteboard. If not, just get a gallon baggie and a dry erase marker, it works just the same too, okay? So thank you guys for another great class. I'll see you next week. Hopefully I'll see you at my review and I'll be sending those as soon as I get them. Thank you guys. Thank you. No, thank you're you. welcome.